Hey, hold on, wait a minute. Before we get started, I got one question to ask y'all. Who is this YouTuber that just got 200,000 subscribers? Me. Thank y'all so much, y'all. I could not have done it without you guys, and I am very appreciative. All right, so to move on, I'm Ashley with Ashley Says So, and I'm back with another Old Hollywood Scandal video, and today we are going to be talking about Mr. Sonny Liston, and I need all of y'all to gather around and find a nice, quiet spot because I'm going to tell this story as an actual story because Sonny Liston is almost a myth. So gather around and let's listen to the story of the man that they say died on the day he was born after this disclaimer. I'm not sure what's true or false in this video. I take gossip and tea and scandal from online, from books, from magazine, from word of mouth, and I ball it all up and I tell you guys a story. The whole video is for entertainment purposes. I have done my research. Make sure you do yours. Now, let's get to the video. Charles L. Liston, aka Sonny Liston, was born in Pine Bluff, Arkansas on a day nobody remembers. His mother, Helen Liston, was too busy to remember, and his father, Tobe Liston, just didn't care. You see, the Listons were a huge family that some say consisted of over 10 children. So by the time Sonny, who was next to the last, came along, he was really just another mouth to feed. This child was so much on the back burner that after his mother, Helen, gave birth to him, she just got up and went along about her own business. It was the midwife who said, Lord, have mercy. Well, somebody got to name the boy, and it was she that gave him the name Charles L. Liston. Uh, gossip claims that even if you ask one of Sonny's family members today what the middle initial L stands for, they wouldn't be able to tell you because the only person who knew it was the midwife. So as you can see, just by this man's entry into the world, his childhood was not going to be worth a squat. And it wasn't. The folks say that Sonny was an invisible child. Nobody paid attention to him. Nobody educated him in any way, not even on the basics of life. Some authors claim that Sonny's family barely even talked to him, and he didn't talk to them at all. And I'm not sure if Sonny would have classified as a mute per se, but it was almost like he was born with a heavy, deep sadness inside of him that always kept him apart. There was one instance of conversation conversation though, and that is when his father Tobe Liston would force him to work the fields as well as beat him. And not only was Tobe beating on Sonny, the plantation owner on which the Liston family lived on would also beat Sonny. And this type of treatment left deep scars on Sonny, not only mental but also physical. A lot of people used to say that Sonny looked like a slave because the wounds and scars he bore on his back looked exactly like the ones the slaves used to have. Now, as Sonny grew older, his family life became even more disconnected with his mother Helen moving to St. Louis and leaving a 16-year-old Sonny in the care of his older brother. But his older brother was just a chip off the old block and just like Tobe expected Sonny to work the fields all the time, his older brother did as well. Well, Sonny got tired of all this, constant heavy labor and no money, so one morning he woke up and he went outside and he stole most of the pecans off of his brother's pecan tree and he ended up buying a train ticket to St. Louis in search of his mother. And wouldn't you know, when Sonny knocked on the door, his mother Helen came and opened the door and the first words out of her mouth were, Why are you here? What you doing here following me? And so these are the examples of the type of early life Sonny Liston had. Now, a lot of people always talk about Sonny Liston, the big bad criminal in his late teens and early 20s, but what they don't know is that he really didn't start out that way. In fact, when he first got to St. Lewis, he enrolled in school. But when he walked through the school doors and the first thing he heard was, boy, now I know your big old tail ain't here for no learning. Man, we thought you was the teacher. How many grades is you behind? He was absolutely humiliated. And the sad thing about it is that student was probably right. You remember how I said that nobody knows when Sonny Liston was born? Well, Sonny didn't even know when he was born. And so although I'm telling you this story from the standpoint that he was probably around 16, 17, 18 at this time, uh, historians say that Sonny could have been six to 10 years older than he always thought he was. So this man could have been 27, 28 years old 
load walking through this classroom. And Sonny, who was not necessarily mentally challenged, but he lacked problem solving skills. And he was also very socially awkward because he did not talk. So the teasing from the other children, coupled with the fact that he was illiterate and didn't understand any of the lessons the teacher would give him, even when she gave him primary lessons, made Sonny really shamed. And in order to get away from that shame, he stopped going to school maybe after the first week. And even after that, Sonny did not turn to the streets. He actually ended up getting several jobs. But every single one of these jobs would put him in the hardest labor division, like he's basically breaking his back, and then they would underpay him. He was like slave labor almost. They wouldn't even pay Sonny what they paid the other black people. And they did it because they felt like he was slower and illiterate and so they could get away with it. So after a while, Sonny quit these menial jobs. And none of this is an excuse for Sonny's criminal behavior, but you can already see how the blocks in life were always stacked against him. And it was after this failed school and failed job attempt that Sonny did start hanging around with hoodlums, who hoodlums in particular. Now I won't name these guys, but they befriended Sonny because they were around the same age as Sonny and they basically told him straight out that they made their money by sticking people up, stealing cars, robbery, etc. And when they flashed their money, Sonny, being easily led and also very broke, wanted to do what they were doing. And so within two weeks, him and his crew had already robbed about six men. But even with this, you could see just how Sonny Liston's mind worked because this crazy boy wore the same outfit on every single robbery. And what's worse, part of this outfit was a bright yellow shirt. And so with him being the muscle of the group, it would be him that would run up to the victims and push them down or punch them and put them in a headlock. And all of the victims he did this to ran back to the police and told the same story. It was a big black guy with a bright yellow shirt and this caused the police to put out articles in the newspaper warning people to beware of the yellow shirt bandit. And here's another testament to Sonny's thinking process because even after this article was written, Sonny was captured and he was wearing the same bright yellow shirt. And according to one source, it was this arrest that started Sonny's infamous feud with the police police because when the police got him into the interrogation room, gossip claims four officers walked in there and one officer pulled out a pistol and had it trained on Sonny while the other three officers beat the living daylights out of him. Now some people say they beat him in order to get him to talk and tell on his accomplices, but other sources say they beat him just to beat him. They claim that Sonny was already talking and had already given up his accomplices. So I don't know. What I do know is the young man was sentenced to about five or six years in prison and when he walked through those prison doors, baby, everybody's booty hole got tight. And I'm not talking about in an X-rated nasty way. I'm saying the officers and the prisoners because they were scared, they were terrified. He was huge. And they felt like if he came into this prison being unruly and being bad, nobody would be able to stop him. But they need not be scared. Gossip claims that Sonny, especially during this prison stay, was the model prisoner. He did his prison work. He went back to the cell. He never bothered anybody. He showed enough, never talked to anybody. He did just like like he did when he was a little boy. He just wanted to be left alone. But with Sonny having a back as big as a refrigerator and a fist that sometimes measured 14 or 15 inches around, there was no way he was going to be left alone. Not while there was a sport that existed named boxing. And it just so happened one of the priests that worked at the prison, Reverend Aloise Stevens, had strong ties to the boxing world. So as soon as Reverend Stevens laid eyes on Sonny Liston, he immediately signed Sonny up for the uh, prison boxing program. He wanted Sonny to fight the current jailhouse champs just to see if Sonny had it in him. And word on the street says that Sonny Liston knocked every single one of those jailhouse champs off their feet. In fact, the only person who stayed on his feet was professional boxer Thurman Wilson who had been brought in off the streets into the prison to fight Sonny. And even he, after the second round was recorded yelling from the ring, Hey y'all, get me out of here! This cat Sonny crazy, he gonna kill me! He gonna kill me, get me out of here! A pro boxer with years of experience yelling this from the ring? 
Oh, child, please. Reverend Stevens made some calls, and as fast as you can say, ah, Sonny Liston was paroled out of prison and into the Golden Gloves boxing program. And boy, did he shine. He went through all of the Golden Gloves boxers like shredded cheese. I mean, they couldn't hold him. His might was so strong that they couldn't even find sparring partners for him because Sonny would knock the stuffing out of the face mask on the sparring partner. Like some of his later professional opponents would say, he had a jab that would go through you. You felt it reverberating through your whole body when he hit you. And so, with power like this, as well as beating everybody up, there was no way that Sonny could stay at an amateur level. So rumor has it like within one or two months, he was signed on as a professional boxer. And I wanna pause right here and say for all of you boxing fans, now we will touch on some fights, but this story right here is more of a story about Sonny's personal life and struggles. And to get right into those struggles, let me tell you, as soon as Sonny Liston turned into a pro boxer, his life was no longer his. Because gossip claims in the year 1952, Sonny was in the ring boxing one of his last amateur matches and his manager who was standing over to the side watching received a tap on the back. And then a dark shadowy figure leaned up and whispered into the manager's ear, Sonny is ours now, he belongs to the mob. They were going to make Sonny an enforcer, meaning he would beat people up on their say so. And that manager, he couldn't resist because he knew if he did, the mob would just get rid of him. And that's one version of the story. One of the other popular versions of the story says that as soon as Sonny got into boxing anyway, even in prison, he was owned by the mob. You know why? Because they claim Reverend Stevens was owned by the mob and working for the mob. Whichever version you want to believe, when Sonny, who still barely talked, went pro, he sat and watched as the men around him shifted. And there's no recorded evidence that Sonny resisted any of this, but uh, the historians say that even if he would have resisted this, he just would have ended up dead himself. And so Sonny started his life as a boxer and an enforcer. You know, he was fighting in the ring during the daytime and beating up regular people at night. And all of this breaking the law, of course, made Sonny have several interactions with police officers. Officers that he now feared and hated because of that beating that he got. So he didn't trust officers anymore. He hated them and they hated him. The police used to pick on Sonny Liston to no end. They got him for running stop signs or running the red light or driving too fast or driving too slow, not pulling over fast enough, uh, talking to a lady while she was walking on the sidewalk and he was driving his car. So Sonny is stuck between a rock and a hard place. But the whole time he is doing bad stuff for the mob and getting into skirmishes with the police, he is boxing and rising up the ranks. And this may seem like a good thing, y'all, and it should have been for this man, but unfortunately, this caused another level of hate to come into his life. And this was the hate from other boxers, but more importantly, the hate from their manager. They feared Sonny Liston. I mean, he was like the boogeyman to those guys because they knew that he was a better fighter than any of the fighters they had in their stable. And so they didn't want him rising up in the ranks. They didn't want him to get a chance to fight their fighter. And rumor has it, a lot of those other managers worked not only with the police, to mess with Sonny, they also worked with the media. And what their plan was, was to destroy Sonny Liston by giving him a horrendous reputation. Allegedly, Cus D'Amato, the manager of Floyd Patterson back then, and the later teacher and almost father figure of Mike Tyson, was one of these people who worked with the media. And just to give you an example of what I mean when I say they were trying to build this negative and toxic image of Sonny Liston, if some other boxer, black or white, knocked somebody out and won a match, their write-up would be something like, wow, boxer Joe Blow, ain't he something? He knocks out his opponents with one punch. He's a true Superman. We all should aspire to be just like him. But then if it was Sonny who did the same thing, the write-up would be something like, boxer Sonny Liston won a fight by knockout today, but I gotta tell you folks, there is nothing good to say about it. I tell you, I was truly disgusted by how this freak of nature stalks his prey in the ring. He beats 
treats them with no mercy. He's like a big black gorilla up there. He don't need to be fighting nobody. I tell you what he needs. He needs to be put down. I mean, disgusting. It was disgusting. But these were the things that they would be printing about Sonny. He was mortified to see that people pretty much hated him. I mean, he knew that there was already negative things said about him in the newspaper because of the criminal activities and when he would get caught by the police. But this was something good. This was boxing. He couldn't understand why was this negative too. And he was hated. He was hated not only by the white community, but the black community. Because he came along during the civil rights movement. And black people, or should I say respectable black people, did not want him climbing up the ranks. They did not want him to get any recognition because he was the bad black nigga. He's done bad things. We don't want that dude representing us. And it's understandable in some ways because they didn't know what I'm telling you guys now. You know, they didn't know that Sonny was forced to do a lot of things, that he was kind of low educated. They didn't really know that for real. But still though, that's the way it was. The black community did not like Sonny Liston. Uh, this man really had nobody in his corner that was truly for him. Most of America was looking for the great hope or the great one. Who's gonna take this raging animal down? Who's gonna put him back in the cage where he belonged? And one of their earliest hopes was a boxer named Cleveland Williams. And Cleveland Williams was a heck of a heavyweight. Baby, his record was stellar. So if anybody could beat Sonny, it was tough old Cleveland Williams. Cha, Sonny lit Cleveland's hell up. Work Cleveland Williams all the way out with that heavy left-handed jab that he was quickly becoming famous for. Cleveland Williams, I'm gonna say myself, was a great fighter, but he just couldn't hang with Sonny. But of course, even though Sonny won this very popular fight, the public still branded him as the bad person, the bad one. The only person that was showing Sonny true support was his new girlfriend and quickly turned wife, Geraldine. She was the light of Sonny Liston's life and he probably would have killed a man with his bare hands if they messed with his Geraldine. Because Geraldine was one of the few folks that only showed Sonny goodness. You know, she only wanted to love him. She didn't want anything from him. And another thing that made Sonny Liston fall hard was the fact that Geraldine sat down and helped him learn how to read and write. And so he was a very happy man when he married Geraldine either in the year 1957 or 1959. And he tried to just settle down into the regular home life. And it really seemed like he was going to be able to do that and that his life was pretty much gonna be clear skies from here on out. Because another thing that was happening when he married Geraldine is that the mob stopped using him as an enforcer because he had done so well in boxing. The mob wanted Sonny to go all the way up to the heavyweight champion of the world. So they didn't want him getting in trouble with the law anymore. But unfortunately for them, the St. Louis police just would not let this happen. They would not give up in their pursuit of messing with Sonny. There's the story about Sonny Liston walking home and a policeman cornering him and accusing him of drinking. And then the police ends up reaching for his baton and hitting Sonny. And Sonny hit the police right back and broke the officer's leg. Sonny went to prison or jail for seven months. Then you have the other story where Sonny was said to be leaving a bar and a police officer pulled up on him. But this time, the police officer pulled out a gun. Gossip claims as soon as the gun got up here, Sonny grabbed the gun and tossed it away. And then he scooped up this police officer and dumped him head first into a trash can. And although Sonny was punished for these incidents, it still caused the police to have a rage against him. They hated the fact that he was so powerful. You know, no man white, black, or any other color should be this powerful to be doing officers this way. And so it all culminated into the very last incident in St. Louis. There were uh, three officers that pulled up on him and they pulled out their batons and they started beating the heck out of Sonny. Two of the batons broke over his head, but this man would not fall. This destroyed the officer's ego so much that when they finally got uh, Sonny in cuffs, instead of taking him to the jailhouse, they ended up taking him to the outskirts of town close to a set of railroad tracks and putting a gun up to the back of his head and telling him, get out of St. Louis. We don't want you here. If we see you again, we're gonna put a bullet in your head. And so Sonny and Geraldine ended up moving to Philadelphia. And although this move happened under terrible circumstances, Sonny was kinda happy to be somewhere new. He was going to be able to start over clean without any kind of problems with the cops, or so he thought. 
Turns out the St. Louis police was kind of like a scorned lover. You know, they told Sonny to get out of town. They didn't want to see him anymore. But even after he moved out of town, the St. Louis police put out like an under the cover APB to the Philadelphia police telling them, hey, whenever you see this guy Sonny Liston, you need to arrest him because he beat up two of the officers here. Y'all need to arrest him and put him in his place. And the Philadelphia police were only too happy to oblige. But no matter how much the police hated him, no matter how much the public hated him, no matter how much the media hated him, they couldn't do anything with him when it came to his boxing. All those other managers and the police and the media and all this stuff working against him, it all failed. Sonny Liston was the man and he had worked himself up so far that the only fight that he hadn't fought was the heavyweight championship. And so Cus Diamato was running scared because Floyd Patterson was the one that was holding the title at this time. Cus did everything in his power to tell Floyd, listen, no, you don't need to take this fight. You know, this man is beneath you. He's not even a good man. But Floyd Patterson didn't see it that way. He wanted to take the fight. First of all, it was because they had run out of excuses. You know, he feared that the public was going to start looking at him like, mm, I don't know if it's that Sonny a criminal. You might just be scared, Floyd. I don't know. And the second reason he wanted to take the fight is because in his heart, he knew that Sonny Liston had been done wrong. He knew that it was unfair the way this man was always ripped apart. And it was unfair to deny him the chance at the heavyweight title if Sonny had worked his way up like he should have, which he did. So Floyd decided he was going to give Sonny Liston the chance to take the title. And everybody went crazy, especially the NAACP. Baby, they were praying that Sonny Liston did not win. They wanted their flower child, their good boy, Floyd Patterson. He was their Superman. Well, baby, their Superman got knocked clean out two minutes into the first round. I mean, Sonny just shattered Floyd's jaw like it was glass. And so Sonny Liston, the man who had the world against him from the day he was born, was now the heavyweight champion of the world. They say he ran to his wife Geraldine in tears, full of smiles, telling her, I did it, honey, I did it. Hugging her and saying over and over, I'm the new heavyweight champion of the world. Now, they gonna love me now, they gonna love me. On the plane ride home, Sonny enlisted Geraldine to help him write a small speech to the crowd that was going to be waiting for him. And the main thing that was on his mind was the black people, particularly the NAACP. And this is not verbatim, but allegedly the speech said something like, and to my people, the Negro people, I know you guys haven't been with me so far, but I'm telling you now that I'm gonna make you proud. I'm not gonna embarrass you. You don't have to worry nothing about that. I'm gonna be the greatest champ ever. I'm gonna be a champ that the Negro race could be proud of, a champ that everybody can be proud of. And so the plane landed, Sonny got up and he fixed his clothes and he tilted his head just right and the plane door opened and there was absolutely nobody there. There were no crowds, there was no mayor, there was no podium waiting for him to speak, there was absolutely nobody. Sonny was crushed, I mean the man was crushed. There was never a time in history that anybody can recall where a man went and won the heavyweight championship belt for his city and came back and nobody was there. It was always cheering crowds of hundreds, maybe even thousands of people throwing flowers. They'd have a red carpet rolled out, a convertible car sitting there waiting to pick up the boxer and drive him around to the crowd so he can wave. But Sonny Liston got none of that. The city of Philadelphia absolutely failed this man. The people that were actually with him on the flight said that they were embarrassed. You know, they were ashamed. And they said it was the saddest thing they had ever seen in their life. There was one guy that said he was standing behind Sonny when the plane door opened and he saw Sonny's shoulders go from straight back, you know, strong and just slump. You know, he said he kind of just saw the air, the wind, 
go out of his shoulders. The whole thing was really just tragic and it foretold Sonny's career as a heavyweight champion. I mean, during his time as champion, some people would call him the most boring champion ever. You know, when he sits down for interviews, he don't say nothing. He just sits there or he says one word. But what they didn't know and what nobody knew until his wife Geraldine came out later on and told everybody is that the reason that Sonny never spoke, especially as an adult, is because he didn't think he spoke well. He was very insecure about the way that he talked. What if he said a word and that's not what it really meant? What if he mispronounced it? What if people knew that he was dumb? And I'm not saying he was dumb, but that's what he thought about himself. Because like you already know, he wasn't educated for real. But his wife Geraldine said that Sonny was so motivated to try to change the perception of him that he pulled her to the side multiple times and told her, hey, can we just talk? Can you teach me how to talk so I can do public talking? So he really did try. He worked hard to try to be the champ that people wanted him to be. But once he did get comfortable speaking a little bit more, he did one or two interviews. But on both of them, the reporters had a quick wit, just like all reporters do. And so what they would do was ask him questions that were kind of either open-ended or they would have double meaning. And so Sonny would answer it in the best way that he could but when he read the papers later or when he saw the show of the interview come on later he would see that these people had twisted his words in the newspapers they would make his answer seem like the negative of what he was trying to say and so Sonny shut back down I mean he really did turn into the world's first Marshawn Lynch that's all I know is a few words and I've said them all now he would answer questions with one word answers or he would answer the question and talk about something totally different and he basically started to look at the press the same way that he looked at the police. He was scared of them and he hated them for what they did to him. And if you look at Sonny's interviews or pictures, the only time that he really opened up and had a huge, real, comfortable smile on his face was when he was with children because they were innocent. He didn't feel like they were out to get him. And speaking of children, Geraldine never had any of her own children by Sonny, although she did have a daughter from a marriage beforehand but she and Sonny never had a child of their own but they did end up adopting a little boy. Now to get back to the meat of the story since Sonny was basically labeled as the champ nobody wanted and the media had done such a hatchet job on him now they were scrambling because their new champ was so unpopular they were scared that the whole sport of boxing was going to become boring and unpopular. I mean there was a quick wave of interest because Floyd Patterson wanted to fight Sonny Liston again they could promote a fight between good and evil, but uh, good got knocked out once again. So with boxing execs, network heads, and managers, and everybody else scrambling and losing their mind about people losing interest in boxing, they are praying, honey, for something to come along to spice this man's championship up. And there is a boxer on the horizon that will do just that. His name is Cassius Clay. And this young Cassius Clay, AKA Muhammad Ali, is a blessing and a curse for Sonny Liston. He was a blessing because he was the one boxer that a lot of people hated more than Sonny Liston. I mean, this guy was hopping around telling everybody that he was the big man and what he was gonna do and what they wasn't gonna do, and people didn't like that. So the media starts making all type of U-turns. They are trying now to sway the public opinion that Sonny Liston's not so bad. You know, he's the champ. He is a hero now. So suddenly, Sonny is invited on a few TV shows. They also started propping him up to be the fiercest man on this planet. And really, they didn't even have to do all of that to sway the public. The public was already on Sonny's side because they all hated Muhammad Ali. So now the public is even writing letters in. Yeah, I can't wait till our champion, the best man we know, Sonny Liston, I can't wait till he knocks that loud mouth Cassius Clay out. And people started to ask Sonny, you know, what do you think of your opponent? And Sonny would say nothing. And he was telling the truth. He didn't think nothing about Muhammad Ali. To him, Ali was just a blip on his radar. Ali was young and he didn't hold the punching power that Sonny held. So Sonny just felt like, hey, this just gonna be another guy that I'm gonna run over. And so he didn't train at all. Matter of fact, instead of training, 
he had ended up falling for the media hype. Since for the last year or year and a half, they had turned it around to where he was the good guy, it had intoxicated him. He had started enjoying going out to the casinos and the clubs and stuff because now people didn't sneer or jeer at him. Now people were, hey champ, how you doing? Love you. Can I have your autograph champ? Sonny fell so deep into this falsehood that he had now even started cheating on his wife Geraldine with multiple groupies, even being seen out in public with these women. And Sonny didn't care because who needed to train to beat this young big head Cassius Clay anyway? The answer was him. Baby Cassius turned out to be a little bit more than Sonny thought he would. And he hung in there with Ali all the way up until the seventh round, but in the seventh round, Sonny Liston gave up. Child, them fans were so doggone angry, they wanted to bust Sonny Liston upside his head. And so immediately, rumors started to fly that Sonny Liston took a dive, that he gave up the fight because somebody told him to. So to please the fans, Boxing Federation, and all of that good stuff, Cassius and Sonny had a rematch in 1965. And unfortunately, the rematch had people thinking Sonny took a dive more than the first fight. Because because that is when the infamous phantom punch happened. Midway during the first round of the second fight, Ali swung a right hook, I believe it was, and Sonny Liston was on the ground. Allegedly, the punch happened so fast that most people didn't even see it, and for the ones who did see it, they did not feel like that punch had enough power to lay Sonny Liston out. There was just no way. The people didn't believe it, and not only that, Ali didn't believe it. Most people don't know that in that famous picture, Ali wasn't beating his chest like, yeah, I'm the man, I'm the man. No, he was actually telling Sonny Liston, get up, get your tail up from there, stop faking. That punch ain't knock you out. And so, with Ali not even believing the punch laid Sonny out, let alone the public, this fight has become one of, if not the most famous boxing match of all time. And all through time, you have three groups of people. The one that believed that Ali knocked Sonny out and it was a fair and square fight. The second group that feels like Sonny would have destroyed Ali, but the mob told him to throw the fight. And then the third, much smaller group that feels like the Nation of Islam threatened Sonny and told him they would kill him if he didn't let Ali win the fight. All groups have good evidence to back up their claims, especially the second group. But I can't tell you now because it ties in with the end of the video. But to move on with the story so we can wrap up, after the disastrous two fights Sonny had with Ali, he found that all of that sudden love and adoration that he was getting from the media and the public was back to a minimum and really close to non-existent. Not only was his fame fading, but he was back to being the bad guy in the media because see, now they had a new champ. Now Muhammad Ali was the hero. And in order to prop him up, Sonny had to be the big, bad, ugly black bear that he beat. But worse than all that, some sources claim, the mob ended up not being done with Sonny all the way. They were still booking him fights, but Sonny was not as popular anymore. Also, there was no heavyweight title to look forward to. So once again, the mob started to involve him in criminal things. So Sonny Liston ended up right back where he started. And this caused him to go through a severe depression. And although he continued to fight, he started to drink very heavily and allegedly he also started to do drugs. And between this bad living and doing bad things for the mob that he didn't want to do, uh, Sonny just kind of became a shell of himself. He started to take jobs that many thought were beneath a former heavyweight champion. And one of those jobs he took was to be the host at Caesars Palace in Las Vegas. And since the casino wanted to promote that Sonny Liston was their new host, they ended up snapping a picture of him. And people were appalled to see what Sonny Liston had become. And I need to cut in right here and say this. Although Sonny was looking like this and he was drinking and he had all of these vices, when it came to the boxing, he still was winning every single match. As a matter of fact, after he fought Muhammad Ali, he had 14 fights after that that he won. But not too long after he took this horrible picture, something happened. Sonny Liston lost a fight to boxer Leotis Martin. And I 
I don't know what it was about this loss, but rumor has it, it jolted something inside of Son. It was one thing that he lost the title to Muhammad Ali, but it was another thing that these regular boxers were sitting up there knocking him down. But even though he lost that fight to Lee Otis Martin, this would be Lee Otis Martin's last fight because Sonny's punch dislocated the retina in his eye. But Sonny could find no joy in that. So rumor has it, he got himself together. He started working out. He stopped drinking so much. He wanted to get himself completely back together because there were rumors flying about that his next fight was going to be with Chuck Wepner. And baby, they say Wepner would lay it on you. They pumped Wepner up in the newspapers. They said that he was the next Sonny Liston. As a matter of fact, they would say that he's better than Sonny Liston. You know, he's a heavy hitter. And so Sonny is just working. You know, he cannot wait to get this chance with Chuck Wepner. And so the fight is approved and Sonny is excited and then allegedly the mob comes raining on his parade. Now the mob allegedly made a whole lot of money with Sonny throwing the fight for Muhammad Ali. But this here was Chuck Wepner, a white boy. Can you imagine the money that they would have made from the bets, from everything else if this white man beat Sonny Liston? And so rumor has it, they told Sonny, you gotta throw the fight. And just to cut in real quick, this is the reason that I was referring referring to earlier, the reason that a lot of people believe it was the mob that made Sonny Liston throw the fights with Muhammad Ali. And that's very sad because those losses to Muhammad Ali caused Sonny Liston a lot of humiliation in his private life. And here the mob was asking him to do it all over again. And so Sonny gets in the ring with Chuck Wepner and he starts fighting. And he's just doing his regular fighting style. But as the fight went on, Sonny Liston made his decision. He was not going to throw this fight. And so, baby, he started whooping Chuck Wepner's B. Hi. Chuck had a broken cheekbone, a broken nose, cuts all over his eyes. In fact, most people didn't even see how Chuck could see for the fight. And in the ninth round, the fight was stopped because Chuck Wepner's face looked pretty much caved in. And I don't know if Sonny Liston thought about the repercussions of his actions for allegedly denying the mob a fall. You know, maybe he felt like he had been working with these guys for so long and he had brought them so much money that that this shouldn't matter. Or maybe he was just ready to face whatever consequence came with it. Maybe he just found pride and solace in the fact that for once, he stood tall in his life and made his own decision the way that he wanted to make it. But the Chuck Wepner fight happened on June the 29th, 1970. And sometime between the 15th and the 21st of December, 1970, Geraldine Liston came up to her husband and she told him that she was taking their son and they were flying out to spend the Christmas holidays with her family. And so Geraldine goes to visit her family and a few days after she got there, she ends up picking up the phone to call Sonny, but she gets no answer. And nothing seems amiss because it's just a missed call, so Geraldine does not worry about it. After she calls him the next two or three days and Sonny doesn't pick up, she's not really nervous about anything serious. She just figures, you know, maybe Sonny is slipping back into his hard partying way. But as the days keep passing and she keeps calling, then she starts to get nervous. And after the 12th day of no answers from Sonny, Geraldine takes the baby boy and they end up flying back home. When she gets to the house, she notices milk that has been delivered sitting spoiled on the front porch. And when she gets inside of the house, she says there was a terrible smell, but she said she thought maybe she left some food and it was rotting on the stove now. However, when she got to the stove and she saw no food, that is when she became fearful. She got a cold chill up her spine and she starts to tiptoe through the house. And then Geraldine ends up walking into their bedroom and she sees Sonny laid across the bed. He has blood coming from his nose and his body is very badly decomposing. Now this next move caused Geraldine to get a lot of scrutiny over the years because instead of calling 911, she ended up calling their family lawyer first and asking for direction. It was him that told her to call 911, which she did. So when the 
the police got to the house, the first thing that they noticed was Sonny, yes, was laying across the bed, but his feet were planted firmly on the floor. Like it looked like he had been sitting at the foot of the bed and then kind of just laid back. The second thing that they noticed were what looked like fresh needle wounds up and down his arm. And after they started searching the house, the third thing they noticed was a small bag of heroin on the bathroom sink. So immediately the police were like, well, it just looks like this guy had a fatal overdose. You know, it's an open and shut case. But Geraldine said, uh, baby, not so fast. You see, according to Geraldine, Sonny was terrified of needles. She said her husband was deathly afraid, so afraid that he wouldn't even go to the doctor on his scheduled appointments because he was scared that the doctor would need to give him a shot or draw blood from him. So she said there was no way that he would have shot himself up full of drugs. When the police asked her about the heroin they found in the house, Geraldine said she had never had heroin inside of her home and that bag was not Sonny. And I'm not sure if Geraldine said this next part or if it was another one of Sonny close associates but what they pointed out to the police was how could Sonny Liston have given himself a fatal shot of heroin when there were no needles or nothing used to tie his arm up there was none of that beside his body in fact according to some sources there was no needle found around the home at all so what Geraldine as well as some others were hinting at is that Sonny Liston was killed somebody else put those drugs in his arm. And if you ask around, especially to some people who actually knew Sonny personally, they will tell you to their face that the mob killed Sonny Liston. Once he decided to win that fight with Chuck Wepner and not throw it, Sonny Liston's days were numbered. But guess what? Nobody cared. Just like it had always been in Sonny Liston's lifetime, nobody cared. Rumor has it that whoever did Sonny's autopsy report didn't even care to write down that Sonny died of an overdose. They put the man died of natural causes. Although in the autopsy report, they said that he had a, a big dose of heroin in his system. And rumor has it that nobody even cared to give Sonny a death date. Just like nobody knew the date of when he was born, nobody knew the date of when he died. They do now list his death date as December 30th, 1970, but rumor has as it that didn't happen until years later when people were pressuring them to open back up the case of his death. So what do you think happened to Sonny Liston? Do you believe that he gave himself the fatal shot? Do you believe that somebody else gave him the fatal shot? Or do you believe, like the autopsy report said, that he died of natural causes? Whatever you believe, his story was truly one of a man that pretty much died the day he was born. And you know what's sad? This man's tombstone simply says, a man. Ain't that something? Somebody who was one of and quite possibly could have been the greatest boxer in history goes down in history as a footnote that nobody really even remembers. And if you really want to drive the feeling of Sonny Liston all the way home, please go click on the link in my top comment. Go watch that video. But anyway, this is the end of the old Hollywood scandalous tale of boxer Sonny Liston. If you guys liked the video, please like the video. If you guys are new here, please subscribe. If you guys have been sitting here, please subscribe. And I will be back with another video soon. Bye.